Hello, Manning Roaders. Um, welcome to the Sunday morning. Today is the 16th of August, and this is our uh, Sunday, our offering for Sunday worship online here on YouTube. Um, we are still following the uh, presiding bishop's call for the Freedom from Fear campaign, and today is the last week of the set of readings that has been set aside for us um, as we talk about gender based violence in our country. So, welcome. And I hope that this service will be a blessing to you. Our notices for this weekend. Um, again, we'd like to say thank you for the donations to our food bank. Um, it's greatly appreciated by our community. And I would encourage you to keep, uh, keep it rolling uh, as we try to help as many people as we can. Um, our children's church is at 1015 via Zoom hosted by Subbu Moyo. And uh, contacts for Zoom are put out on the WhatsApp group um, the day before. Uh, but if you need it, just let me know and I will add you to the group. Our Dalton uh, project uh, feeding scheme is still going uh, with the Dennis Hurley Center. And helpers are always appreciated. The days that they're feeding are on our bulletin here. Uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday and Sunday. And they feed for one and a half hours between 11 and 12.30. Uh, if you are interested in being a helper on any of those days, even if it's just once, uh, you can contact me on my uh, on WhatsApp or you can contact the church office and we'll put you in contact with Stuart Talbot who will be coordinating the project uh, from the Dennis Hurley Center. We've had a quiet birthday uh, week this week coming up. And so on the 18th of August, we celebrate Nokutula Njutku and we just say happy birthday to you and God bless you and keep you in this week. So today, the theme uh, as we explore the passage of Ezekiel 47 is uh, safe spaces. Now, I'm using the word safe spaces synonymously with the uh, idea of the brave space concept. Um, and I'm going to be putting up a poem a bit later on about brave spaces. Um, and I'm also using adverts, um, adverts that speak directly into uh, masculine concepts as um, creative ways in which safe spaces are being made available for men, for women, for uh, people to talk about uh, gender based violence. And it's unusual that it's coming from the advertising companies uh, for things like beer and razor blades. But I think it's a way that uh, offers an idea of what a brave space can be in our, in our world. One of the adverts we're going to be using as an intercessory prayer at the end of, our, of, the, of the service. So, yeah, it's different, but I think it is about exploring how brave spaces and safe spaces can be created. As we meet online, we try to do something deliberate uh, to try and connect uh, with each other in some way, uh, symbolically. Um, today, we're doing something a little bit different. We're not lighting a candle or using a piece of paper. Today, we're using our breath. So I invite you to make yourself really comfortable where you are. And just spend a few seconds breathing in and breathing out. I invite you just to be deliberate about noticing your breath in and noticing your breath out. We acknowledge our breath today as a reminder of the connection we share with each other, with friends and strangers, a common humanity with lovers and enemies. For we are all animated by the breath of God, so we hold each other gently and with humility, for we hold the sacred. As we are still remaining conscious with our breath in and out. Today I would like you to remember members of our community that are going through some tough time and are in need of healing and wholeness 
and a little bit of love. We pray for Richard Neville, who is in hospital at this moment. We pray for Aubrey Marsh, for Audrey Cathy, for Moira Sessions, for Wally Rundle, for Garth Dreyer, Nolene de Groot. We pray for Zodwa and Piti and her family as they mourn the loss of a grandmother and a beloved mother figure in their, in their lives. We pray for the family of Joan Smith. And Joan Smith has been a part of our congregation for so long. And um, on Saturday last week, she passed on. And so we just remember her, give thanks for her life and the relationships and the laughter and we remember her family. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Zimbabwe and in the Congo. And we pray for our brothers and sisters of Lebanon. Breath connects us. The earth, the dust connects us. Water connects us. We are all held animated and nourished in God's breath. There are a myriad of moments, a universe of things that connect us to each other, even when we deny it, even when we build systems to unravel it, even when we pass on constructed divisions as culture or as tradition or as scientific fact from generation to generation. We cannot escape our interconnection Everyday things remind us, like bread and wine, salt and light, breath. Our task has always been to participate with grace in the connections, not to conspire with the illusions of isolation and division. And I invite you now to say the Lord's Prayer as we listen to the song. I wish for you this day the deep, deep peace of Christ in your homes, with your loved ones, in the midst of all your troubles, in the midst of all your joy. The peace of the Lord be with you. I want to share with you a poem written by a lady that I met this year. I had the great privilege of participating in a conversation around reconciliation and dialogue. Um, and Mickey Scott B. Jones is an African-American uh, justice ad advocate. Um, and she creates um, moments of uh, connection between uh, people who are sitting across great divides, whether those divides are racial or gender or around queerness. Um, and she facilitates this and she calls these spaces, these safe spaces, brave spaces. And I would like to share with you her poem uh, that she wrote uh, and that is used in the construction of the safe space when we meet together. So here it goes. 
Together, we will create a brave space. Because there is no such thing as a safe space. We exist in the, in the real world. We all carry scars. And we have all caused wounds. In this space, we seek to turn down the volume of the outside world. We amplify the voices that fight to be heard elsewhere. We call each other to more truth and love. We have the right to start somewhere, to continue and to grow. We have the responsibility to examine what we think we know. We will not be perfect. The space will not be perfect. It will not always be what we wish it to be, but it will be our brave space together and we will work on it side by side. I think these words beautifully carry for me the, the wondrous, beautiful difficulty of journeying with people who are different from ourselves. Now, in the last few weeks, we have been journeying with a gender-based violence. And I have been encouraged by finding opportunity for dialogue and opportunity for bravery, brave space, uh, in the most unusual of spaces. And today, as part of our service online, we are going to be looking at those unusual spaces. And the first space we are looking at is an advert created by Gillette. Um, the best a man can get. I remember those adverts from when I was a kid. Um, and these adverts, both this one and the one that we will be using a bit later on, have the courage to carve out amidst all the narratives a space for courage, for bravery, a safe space. And I use this today to illustrate what we are talking about in our sermon and what we are holding in as a key concept in our time together here. Bullying. The Me Too the movement against toxic sexual toxic harassment. Masculinity. Is this the best a man can get? Is it? We can't hide from it. Sexual harassment is taking over. It's been going on far too long. We can't laugh it off. Who's the daddy? <laughs> what I actually think she's trying to say. Making the same old excuses. Boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. But something finally changed. Allegations regarding sexual assault and sexual harassment. But she says it's a lot. And there will be no going back. Because we. We believe in the best in men. Men need to hold other men accountable. Smile, sweetie. Come on. To say the right thing. To act the right uh, way. Bro, not cool, not cool. Some already are. In ways big. Yo, men. And small. I am strong. I am strong. But some is not enough. It's not how we treat each other, okay? Okay. Because the boys watching today will be the men of tomorrow. So that advert that you just listened to caused massive controversy when it first came out. And yet it has been used subsequently as a way to bring together men and to bring together women uh, across the globe to actually look at what um, we can create from our humanity that would be more whole, more inviting, and that would be safe. That we would create a world in which gender-based violence and um, toxic uses of power become less and less prevalent for our children. 
And so that's a hopeful way of using and creating a safe space. I continue with that that theme in our reading. We're reading from Ezekiel chapter 47 and we're doing the reading in two parts. We're going to end it at chapter at verse 12 and then we're going to take it up again at verse 21. This forms part of the reading from uh, the lectionary, which is part of the campaign, Freedom from Fear. Then he brought me back to the entrance of the temple. There water was flowing from below the threshold of the temple towards the east, for the temple faced east. And the water was flowing down from below the south end of the threshold of the temple, south of the altar. Then he brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around on the outside to the outer gate that faces towards the east. And the water was coming out on the south side. Going on eastward with a cord in his hand, the man measured 1,000 cubits and then led me through the water, and it was ankle deep. Again he measured one thousand and led me through the water, and it was knee deep. Again he measured one thousand and led me through the water, and it was up to the waist. Again he measured one thousand, and it was a river that I could not cross for the water had risen and it was deep enough to swim in, a river that could not be crossed. He said to me, Mortal, have you seen this? Then he led me back along the bank of the river. As I came back, I saw on the bank of the river a great many trees on one side and the other. He said to me, This water flows towards the eastern region and goes down to Araba. And when it enters the sea, the sea of stagnant waters, the water will become fresh. Wherever the river goes, every living creature that swims, that swarms will live. And there will be very many fish once these waters reach there. It will become fresh and everything will live where the river goes. People will stand fishing beside the sea from Engedi to Echalam. It will be a place for the spreading of nets. Its fish will be great of great many kinds, like the fish of the great sea. But its swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They are left for salt. On the banks, on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, their fruit not fail. They will bear fresh fruit every month because the water from, for them flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves will be for healing. From verse 21. So you shall divide this land among you according to the tribes of Israel. You shall allot it as inheritance for yourselves and for the aliens who reside among you and you have begotten children among you. They have, they shall be to you as citizens of Israel. With you, they shall be allotted an inheritance among the tribes of Israel. In whatever tribe aliens reside, there you shall assign them their inheritance, says the Lord. Thus far from the word of God today, thanks be to God. These seven weeks have been intense. We have had to deal with passages that we don't normally look at, passages that are violent and even triggering, um, like the rape of Tamar. We have also looked at passages using very different lenses. Um, I was particularly deliberate in using tools of uh, what we call hermeneutics, which is biblical interpretation, that really centered the woman's experience, uh, but centered particularly um, the the woman's experience of of abuse um, and used that as my lens through which I read and engaged and interrogated and even prayed with the passage. It's very hard. Uh, Seven weeks of 
having to have to critically look at this um, can leave you feeling a bit shell-shocked. It certainly has left me feeling shell-shocked. I think part of the uh, strategy was to almost uh, shock us into realizing how deep this is. Um, most of the time, we don't really deal with the hard stuff. South Africa tries to, um, but most of the time, we, we just want to get on with, with ordinary life. But for large numbers of us, ordinary life is about dealing with this. Um, so today I want to talk about safe spaces. It's the theme for today that has been set out before us. And I want to begin my discussion with talking a little bit about my childhood. I grew up in a place called Mobeni Heights, which is not far from here. It's about 20 minutes um, down towards the Mamzamtoti. You take the Higginson Highway off-ramp and the first, uh, the first uh, traffic light, you turn uh, left and you're into Mabeni Heights. Um, we used to, uh, you know, during the, the winter holidays this time of the year, um, we would be playing out on the streets. Our back uh, uh, street would be turned into a make-believe Wimbledon court um, and we would be playing tennis with pieces of wood and a scavenged tennis uh, tennis or a scavenged tennis bat and a and a put together sometimes makeshift tennis ball. One of the times we were playing tennis and uh, we were pretty much wrapped up in our game that we heard uh, horrible guttural shoutings coming from one of the houses near where we were playing. Um, uh, one of the ladies on the road was being beaten up by her husband. And this time around, she ran out of her house. And uh, obviously, as children, we knew that we were to be, uh, you know, you could, you, you know, you're not supposed to really be seen. So we kind of melted into the shadows to watch the action. Um, as we watched the action unfold, which was, you know, hard and traumatic, uh, we heard conversations from the neighbors who also came out. And we sat around and we heard this kind of statements. What has she done to aggravate her husband? What does she expect if she decides to walk around the streets? Who does she think she is to talk back to him? As I heard those conversations, I realized that uh, I don't really have a voice. This woman was being hurt. Her life was being beaten physically, literally, um, by, pe by people we knew. And um, the witnesses to this entire event never saw her humanity. What I learned from watching uh, our neighbor being hurt by her husband was that uh, people who look like me, who have my physiology, um, who uh, are women, who have my shape in the world, our voices don't matter. I, I learned that even when we are shouting for our lives, we will never be heard. I learned that when we are shouting for our lives, often the whole community will tell us it's our fault that our lives were in danger in the first place. I, I learned that that the boys in my, in my friendship groups would never have to account for when they hurt me. And I learned that that was normal and that's what I needed to expect. I learned that my mother's voice and my grandmother's voice and the voices of my friends' mothers didn't matter when it came to the value of their own lives. And I internalized that. And I have spent 42 years of my life unlearning that and learning to value my life and the life of other women with the same equal respect that I automatically have learned to give to men. It's a hard lesson, and these seven weeks have been, for me, a unlearning and a relearning 
a reminding of a journey and a way of actually giving voice and value to the women who I have encountered in my pastoral life and in my childhood and in my growing up, um, learning how to name them and value them and pray for them and change my behavior so that they have space to thrive in my relationships with them. We are talking about safe spaces. And I think one of the major ways of creating safe spaces in our communities is actually changing the way we frame the language and the conversations around abuse. So maybe instead of saying, what did she do to deserve the beating? What should have been said were things like, why is he beating her up? Or it's wrong to beat her up. Maybe the community should have been uh, aware of the fact that this was happening, witnessing it, should have been the ones who actually were physically asking for it to stop. I learned in that moment that if I were ever to get myself into a space like that, I wouldn't have anybody speaking for me. I also learned that if I ever witness anything like that happening, it's not my place to talk. I learned instead that it's my place to judge and further dehumanize the person who's being hurt. Safe spaces. Israel had to learn this, this uh, how to create safe spaces in itself. And Israel in itself was a deeply traumatized community. This passage in Ezekiel chapter 47 is written not in an idealistic setting. It's written when Ezekiel himself was writing about and from the exile space. Um, the exile was a traumatizing catacly cataclysmic event in the nation of Israel's being. It was that moment when the entire structure of who Israel was completely fell apart. Israel understood itself to be that the blessed of God. But in the, in the exile, they felt abandoned by God because they were literally taken away from their homeland, placed in a foreign place under foreign rule, made to have incorporate a foreign culture. And that was just the elite the people who could read and write, and the aristocrats. Um, the people who were left behind had their homes decimated, their economy flattened. They were brutalized by the war that, that effectively took away, the people into took away the people who went into exile. They were flat. And out of this comes the admonishments of the prophets who asked Israel to look critically at itself and, and reimagine who they could be. And then comes these kind of passages, this passage from Ezekiel 47, the living waters of God uh, that flow relentlessly, bringing life out of deserts, transforming salty spaces that would never be able to support life into these oases of God's abundance. And then... Uh, 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 Ezekiel says, when the land is being divided, the imagination of the Israelite people had to learn how to accommodate the alien, they call it. The, and throughout um, the Old Testament, uh, any passages around um, what to do with Moabites and Midianites and Philistines were always around how you shouldn't marry, you shouldn't eat what they eat, you shouldn't fraternize with their women, you shouldn't, you shouldn't associate with them. And suddenly in this moment of God's abundance and God's relentless grace, Israel is told, you are to share the land, you are to treat the alien as equal to yourself. And I think for me, this is critical about a safe space. Safe spaces are places in which we encourage each other to flourish. Safe spaces are about places in which other people's humanity is seen as sacred. Safe spaces are about acknowledging uh, when wrong has happened and when wrong has happened to the person. 
and when you have been part of that wrong. Safe spaces are difficult spaces because in those spaces we have to watch our agency, our language, the way we behave, not to censor ourselves as in some kind of, uh, kind of, uh, uh, how you put it, in disingenuous political correctness. But we have to look at ourselves because the image of God that I carry in me is is just as important and valid as the image of God that the other person carries in them. Even if that person has a different skin color, even if that person is a woman, even if that person is a child, even if that person is queer, even if that person was not born in South Africa but born in Nigeria, even if that person is nothing like me, that person is an articulation of God's love in the world. And a safe space starts there. So for me, God's relentless energy in the world orientates to grace. And our job is to create spaces in which we can articulate each other's value. That's what church is about. Church is about holding the diversity of humanity together and saying to each other, reminding each other of our innate value in the world so that we can remind the people in our workplaces, in our schools, in our homes, in our communities, that they too bear God's image and that we are committed to each other. Safe spaces are difficult to manage. And yet it is, it's in there that God's invitation is birthed to us. I go back to that story uh, of me playing, quick, uh, playing tennis uh, on Silver Bell Terrace. And I would wonder what would, have, what would it have meant for that lady who was being hurt to have been surrounded by a community of people who valued who she was. And I think that's what the presiding bishop's call has been to us. In these last uh, seven weeks, we have been asked to think about that question in relation to how we hold women and children and people who are different within our church spaces. I, I don't think it's a, it's, a, it's a bad question to ask. And even though the journey has been difficult, I don't think it's without hope or without God's joy or without God's love. I think sometimes hope and joy and love lead us into really difficult places where we have to think very carefully about ourselves. But God never leaves us in those places without, without answers. God never leaves us in those, in those places without a way out. And the way out is to learn how to value each other's humanity. Ezekiel had this vision in the midst of the exile. We are having this vision in the midst of a pandemic. Maybe cataclysmic moments help us understand what is really truly worth our energy. And maybe it's really worth our energy in creating and cultivating a world in which we're in, where women, men, children, the elderly, queer people, people who weren't born in a particular country but live in that country, where all of these people and all of the expressions of humanity feel safe, are valued. Because if we start doing that, I think the new heaven and the new earth is just a blink away. I would like to introduce to you now an advert that was used by uh, Carling Black Label um, in 2019. What happened was the Great Soweto Derby uh, was being played and Carling Black Label and SAB used this as an opportunity to create awareness but also to create a safe space using uh, and a brave space using uh, soccer songs to address gender-based violence and its connection to sport and its connection to alcohol use and uh, it actually was a brave move by uh, Carling Black Label to challenge itself in this uh, moment. And I want to use this today not only as an example of what it means to create a brave, safe space, but also uh, to use some of the uh, 
words uh, that that has been used in the songs as a, a form of prayer, um, as a form of intercessory prayer at this moment. And I hope this, uh, this advert, strangely as it is, um, promotes a brave, safe way of life uh, for us uh, today. begin to wind down our time online. I invite you to embrace the poem by Mickey Scott B. Jones again, but this time you'll be listening to it accompanied by some music.
So now at the end of our service, I wish this prayer upon you and upon me and upon the entire world and South Africa and and here it goes. May the peace of the Lord Christ walk with us into brave, safe spaces. May Christ guide you with courage to be vulnerable and honest. May Christ bring you into just hold relationships with others and the earth. May Christ bring you to swim with us in those rivers of grace. So just to say that we will be online uh, next week and also uh, hopefully with a Friday meditation. And uh, there is now a midweek uh, reflection that goes out on email, just a simple word document that you can use and read through and use as part of your prayer life. Um, and I hope that this helps us stay connected and uh, feel like we are part of community in this time. Uh, these are our account details. Uh, just to say thank you, a very, very big and deep thank you to those among you who continue to pledge and tithe uh, we are so incredibly grateful um, and uh, yeah I, I, I'm gobsmacked and I don't know what to say but if you feel like you are able um, here's our banking details for, for those who can continue in their giving until, uh, until probably Friday uh, I wish you well and have a beautiful and lovely week